Good morning and welcome to the 13th meeting. It's going to be lucky for us all, I'm sure, of the Citizen Participation and Public Petitions Committee. Um, we have apologies this morning from Fergus Ewing and from Paul Sweeney, but we are joined uh, in substituting for Paul Sweeney by Carol Mock and welcome to you, Carol. And our first item of business, therefore, is just since this is the first time you've been with us, just for you to declare any interests that might be relevant to the committee. I have no interest to declare, and if I can just refer people to my register of interests. Thank you very much. Brings us to item two, which is consideration of continuing petitions. Um, we're joined this morning by two of our parliamentary colleagues, Brian Whittle and Katie Clark, who will be contributing to two of the petitions before us. Brian Whittle, in relation to the first, we'll come to him in a short while. Um, this one relates to the upgrade of A75, A77, petition numbers 1610 and 1657, lodged by Matt Halliday and lodged by Donald McHarry, respectively, of the A77 Action Group. Uh, P 1610 calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to upgrade the A75 Euro route to dual carriageway for its entirety as soon as possible. And petition number 1657 calls on the Scottish Government Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to dual the A77 from Air Whitlet's roundabout south to the two ferry ports at Cairn Ryan, including the point at which the A77 connects with the A75. Now, we previously considered uh, these petitions, agreed to consider them both together. We received evidence really over on the petitions over a number of years and we've also taken evidence from the Minister of Transport. We then received an update from the Scottish Government outlining relevant outcomes from the Strategic Transport Projects Review 2 and that includes recommendation 40 access to Stranraer, Cairn Ryan which highlights proposals for improvements to the A75 and A77. Now, the petitioner of PE 1657, that's, Matt Hall, uh, no, that's Donald McHarry, um, has sent us a written submission which raises concerns about delays in relation to landslides and draws attention to the potential solution of road tunnelling at the rest and be thankful. The petitioner for 1610, that is Matt Halliday, has also submitted his views reiterating that the situation has not moved forward and that the same issues are once again arising in the A75. He raises concerns about connectivity for the southwest of Scotland and highlights the benefits of shortened journey times. Uh, we've also received uh, written submissions from Eleanor Whittam, MSP, and from Findlay Carson, MSP, reinforcing yet again their support for the petition, highlighting the economic importance of both the A77 and A75 and stressing the need for further investment. Um, before we uh, consider afresh uh, the evidence that we've previously heard and where we might go next, um, we're joined by Brian Whittle, as I said a moment ago, and I'm going to invite Brian to speak uh, and update us on his views in respect to the petition. Brian. Thank you, Gavin. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to once again speak in this particular petition. I think it's a long-running petition. It was raised while I was in the Petitions Committee in the last term. Um, it is a longer running saga than that. It goes all the way back to 2010 and before, but in 2010, when uh, the then First Minister Alex Salmond opened uh, the Cairn Ryan ports, um, he committed to uh, improving the transport um, uh, and the connectivity of, of, of uh, the A77 and the A75 because there's such a huge volume of traffic especially around the big 44-tonne uh, lorries, where 44% of uh, all goods going in and out of Northern Ireland go through that port, uh, and a lot of it is the just-in-time um, uh, goods such as, uh, such, such as food. So yeah, it's a hugely important uh, port to the southwest of Scotland, to the, the prosperity of the southwest of Scotland, and to uh, the, whole of, uh, the whole of Scotland. Uh, the 77 connects Cairn Ryan to... Central Belt and the 75 uh, connects um, Scotland to the south, uh, um, all the goods come through from, from Ireland to, to the south. It is under threat uh, because there is another route, uh, Dublin Holyhead, where the connectivity has been invested in. There, uh, you come off at Holyhead onto Joe Carriageway straight away. You can now go from motorway from Belfast down to Dublin. So the actual time um, it, it takes for goods to travel. Um, um, it, it is becoming closer between the, the Dublin Holyhead and between Belfast and Cairn Ryan, and there is evidence to say about six or seven percent 
of um, uh, 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 goods are now travelling, uh, uh, are moving to the, the, the Dublin Holyhead. So it is under threat. And, and I think if anybody who's travelled that route, and I have actually t undertaken that route uh, from Glasgow down to Cairn Ryan in a 44-tonne lorry, uh, I, I would advise you do that sometime. Because, you know, it's very interesting when you're going through places like Girvan and, and uh, um, very narrow streets and you can see out, your, out the cab people having their dinner about three yards away from you. Um, but it, it, it is quite a dangerous route. It is a route that if something happens on the 77, which is frequent, um, the, the diversion takes you onto a B road, which is extremely dangerous for 44 tonne lorries. This is an ongoing saga. It is taking too long. We need investment in the South West. Only 0.04% of the transport budget in the, last, in the last decade has been spent in the South West. It is the forgotten, I used to say it was the forgotten part of Scotland. I think now uh, the, the feeling is it is the ignored part of Scotland, and we do need this to move along much quicker than it is. Thank you. Thank you. I did in a previous life used to deliver uh, lorries to uh, <laughs> to customers, but not the largest. I didn't have to have an HGV licence, but they were big enough. I can tell you. So I, I simply, well, there was the, the view was fascinating. I always thought from from the cab. Um, you just can I just ask, uh, Mr. Whittle, you touched there on. I think you might have given us a figure about a transference from this route to the Dublin Holyhead route. Did you say? Did I hear you say something like six percent? Is that traffic that would previously have gone on the Cairn Ryan route that is now going on the Dublin Holyhead? Do you know? Or is that something correct? It is. Yes, I, 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 where, can I ask where that information, where that, where that came from? Belfast Harbour, uh, one of, the, and, and part of my. Um, uh, investigation into this uh, this issue. Uh, I actually uh, travelled across to Belfast to meet with businesses across there, and with Belfast Harbour. Uh, I, I looked at how uh, the southwest infrastructure is impacting on Belfast uh, and, and goods over there, and that was from Belfast Harbour themselves. Said at that time, it was six percent. Um, I couldn't tell you the, uh, where it accurately is now, but certainly it won't be declining. It'll be increasing that that percentage. I would think. Okay. That, that's helpful. Um, colleagues, do any have any comments, questions, or suggestions? David Torrance. Um, around the petition, the convener, it's been with us a long time, and from the information that we have got back, the South West Scotland Transport Study does not recommend taking forward an option of full June of either A75 or A77, opting instead to recommend target road improvements and the draft report on the strategic transport projects review too recommends the safety, resilience and reliable improvements are made on the A75 and the A77 strategic road corridors. And the Scottish Government's response signals that they intend to upgrade both these routes. My concern though is, um, with that information, I would like to close the petition down under Rule 15.7 of Standing Orders, but I would write, like to write to the Cabinet Secretary for Net Zero Energy and Transport seeking information on a time scale for these improvements, because that's the thing that we've been missing in this committee. Thank you. I think I'm reluctant personally to close the petition down without trying to drill down on <coughs> that, that information. I accept that I think we need to get some sort of date. I wonder if the clerks could try and verify that information from Mr Whittle in relation to Belfast, because I think if we were asking for a timeline, it would be quite good to couple that with evidence that the delay in establishing a timeline is now leading to a transference of the potential business that would use that route and that that could have a compound effect in due course and undermine you know, the financial viability of the region and the route, uh, which is why we think the delay in not getting any firm time scale is unhelpful. Mr Stewart. I, mean, I, I, would, I would concur with you, Convener. I think that we require to get some clarity uh, from the, the Cabinet Secretary uh, with reference to uh, the access to Stranraer and Crane Line. And, and I think, I, notwithstanding, it's been here a long time, and I appreciate that, but I do think there is still merit uh, in trying to find more information and clarity before we get to that stage. So I would be supporting you, Convener, uh, in ensuring that we get that information uh, and not closing the petition at this stage. If you make, if you okay. Well, well, well I mean, I, 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 there is only so far a committee can take things, but I, 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 I think it's worth just 
pursuing it because there is a commitment to do something. There's just no commitment as to when it will be done. And I think we might want to try and get the latter. OK, thank you very much. Um, our next petition is petition number 1865. Uh, suspend all surgical mesh and fixation devices lodged by Rosanna Clark and, and Lauren McDougall. Um, the petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to suspend the use of all surgical mesh and fixation devices while a review of all surgical procedures which use polyester, propylene or titanium is carried out and guidelines for the surgical use of mesh are established. Uh, I'm delighted that we have Katie Clark with us this morning. Welcome, Katie, and I'll invite you to contribute in just a moment. We last considered this petition on the 8th of June. When we heard evidence from Mary Todd, the Minister for Public Health, Women's Health and Sport, the Chief Medical Officer, Professor Sir Gregor Smith, and the Senior Medical Advisor, Terry O'Kelly. Uh, and following that meeting, we have received two new responses from the petitioners, who both remain unconvinced that the Scottish Government has listened to the concerns raised through this petition. Uh, we've also received a submission from James Young, who shares a powerful account of the impact a mesh implant had on his quality of life. And we will come on to discuss the evidence we've received, uh, in addition to the evidence, of course, that we heard from Sh uh, Shoulders Hospital in Canada in the round, uh, in a moment or two. But before we do so, can I invite Katie Clark, if you'd, she'd like to speak to us in relation to the petition? Thank you very much, Convener. I'm very grateful for having this opportunity. Um, as you know, I've not been before the committee before, but I'm here today representing the lead um, petitioner, who is a constituent and is unable to be here today due to medical conditions associated with the MESH procedure that was undertaken on her, I have to say, without her knowledge or consent. And she is, I think it's fair to say from my meetings with her, someone that is very informed, um, had very detailed discussions with her medical practitioners before the procedure and was given information about what would be used um, that was very different from what happened in reality. Um, so I think it's fair to say that those involved in the campaign have had life-changing, you know, life-changing conditions which are completely associated with the MESH procedure that they undertook. And indeed, there have also been deaths that it is believed are associated with the procedure. So what they're asking um, is that MESH is only used where essential, that there are alternatives to MESH, and MESH is only used with the fully informed consent of the patient. Um, I know that the committee is very aware of the previous debates round about transvaginal um, mesh and other procedures. The mesh used um, in relation to hernia operations, etc., is, I understand, different and is used um, for different purposes. Many of the issues are similar, and it has to be said that the campaigners still believe that they're not being listened to and their concerns are not being taken into account and practice has not changed in relation to these matters in Scotland. So I'm grateful for your consideration of what they're saying. Thank you very much. Um, colleagues, I mean, there's an opportunity for us to consider this. I note also in relation to uh, transvaginal mesh that uh, our colleague Daniel Johnson has a members debate uh, tomorrow in the chamber, but doesn't touch directly on the issues relating or arising from this petition, which are the, the broader extension of uh, mesh, and that's the Kind of that have been the focus of our inquiry. Um, I think we did raise with the Minister in passing suggestions that the, there was a campaign to have the ban on transvaginal mesh lifted, but I think we got reassurances from the Minister, if I recall from the evidence, that there was no immediate plans to do anything in relation to that, which is reassuring. But in relation to this, there has definitely been a mixed bag of evidence that, that we've heard. Um, together with the shoulders and uh, evidence which suggested that there were alternatives that might yet still be useful, albeit it required quite a rigorous discipline on the part of the individual concerned before they would be physically capable of withstanding the rigours of that. And I think there was some concern from the Scottish Government that that might be uh, something of a cherry-picking waiting list of people who would only get treatment under certain circumstances, um, albeit I wasn't sure there wasn't a way around any of that. W what thoughts do colleagues have? Do we have any? <laughs> Thank you, convener. Um, Carol, did you want to say something? Just... Uh, Thank you. So, sorry, David. Um, just, I, I mean, obviously I've read it in detail because I have also been approached by constituents. I think the key 
thing for me was around this um, fact that we need to, you know, that the, the, they're seen as only if it was essential, and we should drill further into that, um, that um, people should pro be properly informed um, and consent to these procedures, because we know from our previous uh, work on the vaginal, transvaginal mesh, just um, how life-changing these things could be. So to me, it's a very important issue that um, I would like to see it you know, go, go further yeah. so that we get more clarity on it. I mean, just before I come to you, David, one of the, because obviously there are further inquiries we can make, but one of the suggestions is that this might be something that we try to take to the chamber by way of a debate, just to try and inform colleagues more broadly about the wider issues arising from this particular aspect of MESH. Um, I think that might be something we want to consider, but are there any things we might want to just do ahead of that, David? Um, I was going to suggest that, Convener, that we actually take it to ch Chamber for a debate, but there is a whole list of things here that we could ask the Government for information. I'm not going to read them out because the list is so long, but I just wonder if the clerks can uh, write to Government asking for that additional information. Well, I think there are two or three areas in particular. Uh, one of which I think we could explore in a debate is it has now been repeatedly stated that the responsibility for uh, medical devices rests with the MHRA. There is a general view across all parties in this parliament that they have fallen short in their responsibility. And I think all parties have offered to support the government, not just about complaining about that, but potentially seeking to do something more directly about it and that hasn't happened so that's that's a strand that could come out i think there is information relating to the shoulders uh, hospital which shows alternative ways forward some of the themes i think we've heard from the petitioners it was a similar experience that was that their um, experience wasn't taken seriously and they were told it was a bit like the, the whole transvaginal mesh all over again, that they were imagining their pain and that, you know, that other people knew what was best for them and they felt they hadn't had the same informed uh, advice. I think the minister suggested to us that there was a lot of work being done in relation to the wider criteria and guidelines in relation to the way in which all this would be applied. So I do think there is, there is scope for us to potentially take this forward uh, for a debate in the chamber. So... Are we, can, are we content to do that? Uh, well, then, then the clerks can, whenever the Petitions Committee has, it, has a slot, that's one of the things I think we could consider taking forward. Thank you very much. So we'll continue the petition on that basis. Uh, petition 1870, to ensure teachers of autistic pupils are appropriately qualified. Um, this was lodged by Edward Fowler and we last considered it in March. Uh, the petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to introduce legislation requiring teachers of autistic pupils to be appropriately qualified to improve educational outcomes. And we've had quite a lot of previous correspondence, and the committee asked the Scottish Government whether it intends to undertake a child's rights impact assessment of initial teacher education. In response, the Scottish Government stated that it does not consider such an assessment is required at this point due to the ongoing work to improve relevant teaching support and guidance. This work includes a GTC essay's revised professional standards, which specifically reference autism, a suite of guidance on the Additional Support Needs Hub, and the establishment of a working group to develop new guidance to minimise the use of restraint in schools. Um, so we've had this balance between uh, the government believing there are a number of initiatives which they are taking, which address the points that the petitioner has as a, as a substantive cause of concern, but doesn't believe that it needs to move for this uh, mandatory route that they, they are looking for. Uh, colleagues, do we have any views? Alexander Stewart. Uh, thank you, Convener. You know, you've, uh, you've outlined many of the areas that have already been <coughs> covered, uh, and I do think at this stage that we will, it would be possible and probable for us to close it uh, under... Uh, Rule 15.7 uh, understanding orders because I think there already has been uh, stakeholder raised concerns and uh, and the, the, the suggestions of the uh, the approach that's taken place uh, and the Scottish Government are ongoing but but I think in, in closing the petition we can write to the Education Young People uh, Committee to highlight the evidence that we've received uh, in response to the petition 
an advance of the proposed inquiry and additional support needs, because I think that uh, would give an opportunity for that committee uh, to take on board some of the areas of concern that may well be raised. But the com for us, I think, at this stage, uh, it's gone as far as I think we can take it uh, yeah. from our committee. Uh, and by, by giving it to the other committee, it will give it them the opportunity to advance and bring together some of the strands that maybe we haven't been able to uh, assimilate in our committee here. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Mr. Torrance? Yeah, I, Mr. Stewart. Yeah, I mean, I think in this occasion, we have pushed back on a couple of occasions in relation to this, but the government has been quite firm and has scheduled its response and why it believes it's not going to take forward the objectives uh, of the petition, albeit the issues of substance, I think, are there to be addressed. So I think we uh, agree that we're going to close the petition, but we're also going to write to the Education, Children and Young People Committee. Are we ag agreed uh, letting them know the progress that we've made to this stage in relation to the committee? Are we content? We are. Uh, petition 1884, which is to make whole plant cannabis oil available in the NHS or alternative funding put in place, uh, this was lodged by Steve Gillan, and it calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to make whole plant cannabis oil available in the NHS or provide funds for private access for severely epileptic children and adults where all other NHS epileptic drugs have failed to help. We last considered this on March the 23rd, and we agreed that we would write to the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care and the Minister for Drugs Policies, and we've received two responses in the petition. The first response indicates that NHS England remain in discussions around the establishment of two clinical trials to further the evidence base for CBPMs and that patients in Scotland will be eligible to take part in those trials. However, due to the commercially sensitive nature of these discussions, there are limits on what can be shared publicly at this stage. The response also sets out the process and timescales by which a new medicine is, is, is licensed. The second response states that information is not held on the number of people accessing illicit cannabis for medicinal purposes, I suppose self-evidently. Um, it also highlights that programmes to allow people to self-medicate with cannabis in a controlled environment would be in breach of the Misuse of Drugs Act 1971. Now, I, my recollection is that this committee was actually quite sympathetic to some of the evidence that we heard in relation to this and in the positions that we asked the government to, to clarify. So we've got the evidence here that this trial would potentially be something open to Scottish patients. Do we have any views on how we might proceed? David Torrance. Thank you, Convener. Um, Considering that clinical trials will be carried out with a view to building an evidence-based connect with CBPMs um, and unlicensed products are not routinely available on NSS with licensing being the only way to ensure safety, quality and efficiency. Um, and in pending results of a clinical trial, there's no further action that the committee wishes to take on this. So I would, I would consider it. We close the, the petition down to understanding rules 15.7 of standing orders. But in doing so, I'd like the committee to write to petitioner highlighting that the trials that are taking part and that Scottish patients are allowed to take part in them. Yeah, uh, can I ask, uh, just for some advice, in the response that we've received, as well as being able to advise the petitioner on the trial and the fact that Scottish patients will be eligible, do we know how the petitioner could seek to make themselves available no. Um, I'm going to crave the indulgence of the committee just to hold it open one more time. I'd quite like to see if we can find out from the government how somebody goes about making themselves available potentially to establish whether they would be eligible to participate in the trial. I mean, I think it's one thing just to tell the petitioner that they could do that, but I think it would be more helpful to be able to tell them how they could do it. But subject to us having that information to augment the response to the petitioner, I'm happy to close the petition at that point. Happy to agree. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm, it, it, if we get that information, I don't know that the petition needs to come back to us, if I can put it that way. Um, if we're content that we could frame the response in the light of the further information that we receive. Carol Malkin. Um, thank you. Just it obviously be my first time on the Petitions Committee. If we close a petition potentially, 
um, does the individual have the right to come back on it? How, how does that work? They do. It, w when the petition's closed, they can come back after a year if okay. they feel that nothing has advanced, advanced in relation to the petition during that period of time. Yeah, okay. um, but what we obviously have is a clear idea from the government as to the route mm -hmm. that the petitioner could take and a clear direction that they don't intend or are unable, in fact, I mm -hmm. think, to take any further action at this time because it would contravene a law, I imagine, over which they don't have particular responsibility. Is that correct? The drug misuse. So, okay. yes. So they've got options. So they, they can do that. But I think I'd like to give the, the petitioner the most informed information mm -hmm. Possible, yeah. yeah I and I, I, I take it that does that appear on our website in due course? If we does it, so yes. anybody else could see from our website any advice we received and how you would be able to yes. apply. Yeah, well, I think that would be helpful if we've got that there. Uh, petition 1919 that prohibit the sale of high caffeine products to children for performance mm -hmm. enhancement. Um, this is a petition lodged by Ted Gurley and it calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to ban the sale of fast-release caffeine gum to under-18s for performance enhancement due to risk of serious harm. We last considered this again on the 23rd of February and we agreed to write to the Children and Young Persons Commissioner for Scotland, Scottish Athletics, Sports Scotland, Cardiac Risk in the Young and the Food Standards Scotland. And I'm pleased to say we've now received responses from these stakeholders as well as a submission from the petitioner. Members will have noted that many of the responses make reference to the Scottish Government's consultation on the sale of energy drinks, with Food Standards Scotland committed, committing to providing enhanced guidance on food additives, including caffeine, in the coming months. The responses from Sports Scotland and Scottish Athletics highlight the potential challenges of implementing a ban specifically focused on performance enhancement, while cardiac risk in the young and the petitioner also suggested a need for further research to evaluate the impact of these products on young at-risk individuals and athletes. Um, do members have any comments or suggestions for action? I think this was also raised in the chamber at some point, I recollect it coming up. Mr Stewart. I, I, I... I think, you know, convener, there are there are many more questions to be asked on this, uh, and I think you're right that there was recently some uh, debate and discussion within the chamber on the on this very topic. Uh, so I think that the, the Scottish government do require to maybe provide some more clarity and some more information uh, when it comes to uh, the consultation that's taking place. Uh, so I would I would suggest that we we, we seek some of that clarity uh, and and we ask the Scottish government. Uh, about the consultation into the end of sale of energy drinks to children and young people when it's going to be published. Uh, we talk about the, uh, the influence of foodstuffs and uh, that has to include the, the caffeine uh, at gum uh, and plans to review the risk management decisions based on the uh, EFSA uh, advice as part of the Scottish Government's work uh, and what further consideration has been given uh, to the plan to introducing a ban on the sale of, uh, of fast-releasing caffeine products for, the, for those who are under 18, uh, because all of these uh, require to, to have some more clarity as to where we are before any further decisions or discussion can take place. Thank you. I mean, I was mindful of the Scottish Athletics highlighting the potential challenges of implementing a ban. You know, just, uh, these things are very often said, but they're sometimes very difficult to apply. But I, I'm inclined to support Mr Stewart's suggestion and colleagues agreed? We are. Uh, thank you. We'll keep the petition open and proceed on that basis. Uh, I think we specifically do want to know, um, you know, with reference to the foods with equivalent quantities of caffeine, just to direct it very much to the petitioner's concerns. Uh, petition 1926 to expand universal free school meals for all nursery, primary and secondary school pupils, uh, lodged by Alison Dowling. And it calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to expand universal free school meals provision for all nursery, primary and secondary school pupils. Uh, we considered this petition the 20th of April and we agreed to seek further views and information from the Scottish Government and from a number of stakeholders. I'm pleased to say we have received responses from the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills, from COSLA, the Children and Young People's Commissioner Scotland, Public Health Scotland, the Child Poverty Action Group and from the Trussell Trust. Uh, members will be aware that expanding the provision of free school meals has been the subject of discussion in the Chamber, notably in relation to our consideration of the Good Food Nation Scotland Bill. Uh, so on that basis, do members have any comments or suggestions for actions we might take at this point? 
David Torrance. Thank you, Convener. Um, I think the, the Committee should write to Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills, seeking an update on the work being undertaken to expand the provision of free school meals and to ask what priority has been given to extending the provision of free school meals to secondary pupils. I'm happy to do that. We're content to do that. I mean, I, I am. this is another petition that might be one that we would advocate taking to the Chamber for a debate, but I think in the first instance we would wait, await that response from the Cabinet Secretary. That brings us to item three on the agenda, which is the consideration of new petitions. Um, and we have a new petition number 1927, uh, install CCTV cameras in all additional support needs schools. Now, this has been lodged by Claire Mooney, and it calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to install CCTV into every additional support needs school in the country. Now, members will be aware that this petition is similar to one considered by our predecessor committee, Mr Torrance in particular, also lodged by Ms Mooney, which was closed on the basis that from written submissions received, there was limited support for the action called for in the petition, and further information on the previous petition and written submissions is included in our SPICE briefing papers. In the background information, Ms Mooney shares her experience of a family member being injured while being restrained, and the challenges of ensuring a full investigation and explanation of events is provided, particularly where the child may be unable to give an account of what happened. Now, we've also received submissions from Patricia Hewitt and Elaine M in support of this petition, both of whom suggest the use of CCTV could be used as a tool to support and protect vulnerable children, as well as the staff working with them. The Scottish Government's response states it is a matter for local authorities to determine whether or not the use of CCTV cameras on their premises is appropriate, but that in making a, such a decision, consideration must be given to balancing the privacy and protection of the children, young people and staff. Now, the Scottish Government also note that new guidance to minimise the use of physical intervention, physical restraint and seclusion in schools is currently being drafted. That draft guidance on physical intervention in schools has now been made available with the public consultation due to close on the 25th of October. Colleagues. Mr Dorrance. Thank you, Convener. Um, considering that this petition has been... Um by a previous committee, um, there was a lot of work done on it. But what's more importantly, education children and young people have a similar petition with them just now, and they're going to do work around it. Um, I think we should highlight this petition to them, and in doing so, we could then close the petition down, understanding orders 15.7. Uh, and maybe potentially also at the same time, I'll make sure that the petitioner is aware of the consultation yes. that's currently underway. Uh -huh. yeah. But I think the fact that the Education Committee is considering something similar does, I think, allow us to take to, to, to close the petition at this stage on that basis. Are we comfortable with that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, petition number 1930. Can I, 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 meanwhile, <laughs> I did forget to say uh, to anybody who might be watching our proceedings from afar, but before we consider any uh, new petition, we do, in the first instance, seek to get an opinion on the principles of the petition from the Scottish Government. So when we come to consider the petition for the first time at this committee, it is on the basis of us having already undertaken a certain amount of advanced preparation before we consider it here, uh, just so that anybody launching a petition understands that uh, you know, it's not being dismissed summarily. We have, we have considered the issues raised. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, Ms Mooney for bringing the petition to our attention. Uh, the next petition is petition number 1936 to remove potholes from Scotland's roads lodged by Leslie Roberts. Now this petition calls the Scottish Government to urge the, Scot the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to improve road surfaces by creating an action plan uh, to remove potholes from trunk roads across Scotland and then providing ring-fenced funding to local councils to tackle potholes. Now, the petitioner highlights that potholes cause accidents, putting lives and property at risk, and raises a particular concern about partial road repairs, putting drivers and cyclists at further risk. Uh, the Scottish Government's response provides details of their investment in trunk roads, as well as highlighting the obligation on operating companies to inspect the trunk road network at seven-day intervals in order to identify defects. In responding to the call for ring-fenced funding for local authorities, the Scottish Government stated it is the responsibility of each local authority to manage their own budget and to allocate the total financial resources available to them on the basis of local needs and priorities. Um, Nonetheless, I think we know from our own individual post bags as MSPs that potholes are an issue uh, 
uh, which can have quite a dramatic consequence uh, for individuals. And uh, I don't, uh, I mean, I don't know, my own experience is that uh, of an FOI that I undertook or that was advanced to me actually by a constituent, the number of people who are successfully able to claim back uh, the costs incurred as a consequence of a pothole is not high and is usually after a very challenging process from the local authority in relation to that. So I think the issue is definitely one, you know, which sometimes people make light of, but it is actually quite fundamentally important, particularly on roads that are wholly, on which people are wholly dependent for access to services. Mr Stewart, you look like you're keen to speak. <laughs> Uh, thank, thank you, Convener. I am, because I, I, I do believe that this is a major <coughs> issue. Uh, and as you've rightly identified, uh, as some councils uh, seem to manage to do it reasonably well, uh, where others do not. And there are roads uh, that are uh, a danger uh, to, to individuals and, and vehicles. Uh, and I do believe that there is, there is scope uh, for us to consider uh, more information on this. On this. Uh, uh. So I would suggest that we, that we do uh, continue to to seek clarity, uh, uh, convener, and we write to uh, the, the Roadbox Commissioner, the Society of Chief Officers in Transportation in Scotland, uh, the Chartered Institute of Highways and Transportation, and Civil Engineers uh, Contracts Association, and seeking their views, uh, because I think well, their views are very important, uh, with, which has been raised by this petition, uh, and the additional information that they will be able to share uh, will give us uh, an idea of what has been happening with maintenance standards across Scotland. It's also important to talk uh, to the, the RAC Foundation and Road Haulage Association to seek information on the level of uh, reported damage to vehicles or other traffic incidents caused by potholes. Uh, and I think by doing that, uh, we will then get a, a much better picture uh, because, as you've had already indicated, we may know from our own regions, our own constituencies, how things are. Uh, but across Scotland, uh, it, uh, it, it would appear uh, that there are some areas where uh, it is a real concern and a real danger uh, to the road uh, user uh, and the vehicles that they have. Any other comments? <clears throat> We're content to act as Mr. Sir. Can I perhaps suggest that when we write to the RAC Foundation and the Road Haulage Association, that we maybe also ask them what information they have on um, the reimbursement or uh, restitution that individuals who have been affected by this actually have and if they've they've got any information in relation to that because I think that's material as well we're content we are uh, petition number 1937 uh, to give children the respect they deserve by providing options for privacy when changing for PE and this has been lodged by Gillian Lamara uh, an important issue and the petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to implement the option across all schools for primary school children to wear their PE kit to school on the days they have PE. Now, the petitioner considers these protections are necessary to ensure children's privacy and tells us that while COVID-19 restrictions were in place, some schools brought in the option for children to wear their PE kit to school. However, since the restrictions have been lifted, the pandemic restrictions, that is, schools have taken this option away, uh, allegedly taking this option away, meaning that primary pupils are having to get changed for PE in front of mixed gender classmates and their teacher. Now, the Scottish Government response indicates policy decisions on school clothing are best taken by schools and education authorities. It also highlights the statutory responsibility of local authorities to manage and maintain their school estate and the expectation that local authorities would provide appropriate changing facilities. We've received a submission from the petitioner responding to the Scottish Government, and this highlights that some schools do not have appropriate facilities for pupils to get changed, and raises concerns about the onus being put on parents to contact head teachers to resolve this, rather than the relevant authorities ensuring the appropriate changing facilities or alternative options are provided. Do members have any comments? Mr Torrance. Thank you, Convener. I wonder if we can ask... Um write to the petitioner so she could share her views of the Scottish Government's consultation on school uniforms, which is open until the 14th of October. Um, There's certainly an opportunity yes. to do that. Um, and I, I wonder if we could, the committee could write to the Commissioner for Children and Young People on their views to do with the petition. And, but COSLA is probably the one that's most important to us. If we could uh, write to COSLA and ask for information around guidance and best practice in schools around the issue. 
Yep, I'm content to do all of that. We're content. Any other thoughts? Um, I mean, I think it might also... I just wonder whether we might, in seeking advice from them, try and establish whether they are aware of any widespread public concern on this issue as well. I mean, because I'm, what I'm not clear about is how widely this might be a, an issue of concern. Uh, but thank our petition for that. We'll keep petition open and revert when we have that information. Uh, petition number 1940, to permit nest protection as a valid system under new fire and smoke alarm law. And this has been lodged by Campbell Wilde, calling on the Par Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to permit nest protect as a valid system under the new fire and smoke alarm law coming into force in February uh, 22, which came into force presumably in February 22. In response to the petition, the Scottish Government states its view that allowing this system would be inappropriate because it does not meet the necessary British standard required under the interlinked fire alarms legislation. The Scottish Government highlights its joint statement with COSLA, which confirms that there are no penalties for non-compliance. Uh, we've also received a submission from an individual, Michael Clark, who has indicated his support for the petition, and he shares his positive experience using Nest Protect system and notes its additional features which provide further safety benefits. Um, do members have any comments or suggestions? Are any of us familiar with Nest Protection? Particularly? Right. Mr Torrance. Thank you, Kavita. Um, considering that um, it doesn't meet British standards, which I think is really, really important, and that there's no penalties um, for um, the heat alarm systems, and local authorities are going to be quite lenient in taking a measured approach to the installations of them, I think um, we, the petition can be closed under Rule 15.7 of Standing Orders. Thoughts? Convener, I would concur. I think that if it doesn't meet the British standards, it would be very difficult for us to uh, support uh, uh, any apparatus that, that doesn't come up to the qualified uh, levels of expertise and, uh, and efficiency in this very difficult situation when you're dealing with a smoke alarm situation. Uh, it has to have and must have uh, the, the, the proper qualifications and meet the right standards uh, uh, or it, it's, it, it could jeopardise individuals. I mean, I don't, I don't see anything in the briefing that we've received that I think would change the fact that it is not approved. You know, one consideration would have been to see the system in practice, but it's not going to change the fact that it, it isn't standard approved. And so I, I don't really see that that allows us to take the thing any further forward. So I'm, I'm inclined to agree that, that, that in view of the uh, evidence we've received, we would have to close the petition. Are we, are we content with that? Okay, thank you. Um, petition number 1941, to stop the destruction of headstones within community cemeteries. This is lodged by Councillor Andrew Stewart Wood. And it calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to monitor and regulate actions taken by local authorities when undertaking their statutory duty of ensuring health and safety within our cemeteries. The spice beefing we've received for the petition explains that local authorities have general duties to address hazards in, public, in burial grounds, but the maintenance of headstones and other memorials is the responsibility of the owners of the burial grounds. The Scottish Government indicates that it is unable to intervene in operational matters affecting burial grounds because that is the responsibility of the relevant burial authority. The response highlights the work of the Burial Regulations Working Group and plans to prepare a statutory code of practice and associated guidance for burial authorities. Now, I've certainly had expressions of interest and concern in relation to this petition. Do colleagues have any views? I mean, I, I, I think there is, there is no question that this has been raised by uh, a number of individuals and that 
uh, as far as local authorities are concerned, uh, it would be the case that this seems to be now practice in, in some areas. Uh, and I appreciate that uh, individuals may no longer be able to maintain or, or individuals may no longer be part of the process to look after a headstone because they have, the family are no longer there or the uh, are individuals have deceased. And, uh, uh, but this does, does become uh, an issue that we need to get some clarity. So I think COSLA is one of the first places we would want to go uh, to ask whether local authorities routinely lay their owners and how they liaise with them because I think that's very important uh, to find out where, uh, when it comes to maintenance, and, and I appreciate that it's health and safety uh, that the council is looking at, but at the same time, you know, this, this can have a, 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 a massive impact on a, a family if they turn up to see, and, and that, that is the situation. Uh, and I, I've certainly had individuals who have written to me on this specific topic, and I've liaised with it. But I think that there is also uh, opportunities to talk to and write to the Borough Regulations Working Group because they uh, have a role to play in this uh, and the need for them to, to value the national support and, and monitoring in relation to local authorities uh, and whether a, a funded maintenance and repair policy uh, uh, will be considered uh, and a timescale and how we would plan for that timescale I think is also quite important uh, to ensure that we do that. So uh, these would be some of the recommendations I would put forward, convener. Any other thoughts? Uh, convener, I agree totally with my uh, colleague, um, but can uh, committee write to the chair of the burial regulation working group requesting that the group engages with the petitioner? Indeed. Um, <clears throat> I think I'd quite like to hear from the petitioner. Uh, actually. Um, so I, I'd like to take forward those actions, but I think I, I would quite welcome the opportunity to have a discussion uh, with the petitioner when we've received those responses back uh, in order to hear what the petitioner's view is. It was an elected councillor, so it could be quite interesting. Um, I don't know, I, I maybe invite the clerks to consider if there's anybody else that might be useful just to speak with on, in the light of the responses that we receive. Uh, because I, I think this would be would be interesting. I mean, I've had representations, and I don't know whether they are hearsay or not. That's why I think it's worth that that in some cases a kind of general decision has been taken just to go in and flatten a lot of headstones, whether they are at risk or not, as a preemptive measure without reference, um, and that a lot of relatives have become you know been quite distressed to find that this action has been taken. So that it does seem to me to be in the drafting up of guidelines, something of an open environment at the moment where there's an opportunity to discuss some of the issues raised here, into which I think we might make a useful contribution. So if we could do that, I'd be grateful. The committee can um, Petition number 1944 to enforce the engine idling ban. Uh, the next petition has been lodged by Alan Ross and it calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to enforce the engine idling ban and take action to introduce instant £80 fines for offences, reclassify idling as a high traffic offence, to legally oblige local authorities to enforce the engine idling ban, to create contact points for public reporting, to increase anti-idling signage in public places. The SPICE briefing explains that statistics on engine idling enforcement action are not routinely published, but that the FOI requests indicate that fixed penalty notices are rarely if ever issued. In response to the petition, the Scottish Government states that the current approach to enforcement is fit for purpose and is proportionate, with penalties viewed primarily as a deterrent. The response states that local authorities undertake educational and awareness raising campaigns to prevent idling and traffic enforcement in areas of known concern. The petitioner believes this response is inadequate and does not address the petition's proposals or reflect the gravity of the issue. He points to the rise in vehicles on the road since the Act was updated in 2003 and the health risks associated with inhaling car fumes. He raises issues with enforcement and stresses the climate impacts. I mean, I, I would note that since 2003, a lot of cars automatically cut now, uh, is my experience, to prevent engine idling. So the manufacturers have actually, in more recently... Uh, more recently produced vehicles incorporated into the mechanics of the vehicle 
um, an engine idling a cutout facility. Uh, colleagues, do we have any views on this new petition or what we might next do? Mr. Torrance. Thank you, um, Convener. I wonder if the committee could keep the petition open just now and give us a chance to write to COSLA, the RAC Foundation, and Professor Adrian Davis in Napier University seeking their views on the action called for in the petition. Are we content to that? Yes. We are. Uh, so we will write as suggested by Mr. Torrance and uh, keep the petition open uh, and then consider it afresh when we hear from those bodies. Um, that actually now concludes the public section of our meeting this morning. We next meet on the 26th of October and we will now move into private session to consider agenda item four. So uh, I suspend the petition and members might wish to get a cup of tea or something in the meantime. Thank you.